a linear function is nice and easy to deal with. For example, if I have a function f of x that's linear, then we could look at the slope of this function. If we view the function as an input-output machine, then the slope is the change in the output over the change in the input. How do you determine the slope of a linear function? Well, let's draw its graph. So let's plot the graph of f in blue. Let's say we start at some input, we'll call it x0. Then its output is f of x0. Then let's change its input by amount, let's call it delta x, so that the new input is now x0 plus delta x. Well, then the output changes to f of x0 plus delta x. How much did the input change? Well, it just changed by delta x. How much did the output change? Well, that's just equal to the new output, f of x0 plus delta x, minus the old output, f of x0. So f of x0 plus delta x minus f of x0. And we can call that change delta f. Therefore, we could write the slope, which we often denote by the letter m, as equal to delta f over delta x, or f of x0 plus delta x minus f of x0, that's the change in the output, divided by the change in the input delta x. Or maybe the notation would be easier if we labeled the new point as x1, and then the output at the new point would just be f of x1, so x1 is just another way to write x0 plus delta x. If we did that, then the slope could also be written as just f of x1 minus f of x0, that's the change in the output. So the change in the output looks a little simpler, but now the change in the input is going to be x1 minus x0. Both of these two expressions are the same thing, it just depends on whether you want to call the second point x1 or x0 plus delta x. For a linear function, the slope does not depend on the choice of the point x0 nor the width of the interval delta x. That's an important property of a linear function. Its slope is the same everywhere. The slope is equal to the rate of change of the linear function, and the rate of change of a linear function is always the same. Linear functions are nice and easy to deal with, but most of the time we'll be dealing with nonlinear functions. One part of calculus is approximating nonlinear functions by linear functions. How do we go about approximating nonlinear functions by linear functions? Let's imagine I have a nonlinear function. We'll call it f of x again. So if I want to approximate the function f by a linear function, I could pick two points. Let's call one x0 and one x1. And I could draw a line from the point on the graph of f above the point x0 to the point on the graph above the point x1. It would look something like this. This line is an approximation to the function f, and it's called a secant line. The secant line is a line that goes through two points on the graph of the function. The slope of the secant line gives the average rate of change of f. What is the slope of the secant line? Well, it's the same expression we had before for the linear function f. It was the change in output, delta f, which is the change between the heights of these two points, divided by the change in input, delta x, which is the distance between these two input points. In other words, it is f of x1 minus f of x0 that's the change in the output, divided by the change in the input, x1 minus x0. For a linear function f, the slope didn't depend on the choice of the points, x0 and x1. Does it matter now for our nonlinear function f? The slope of the secant line will depend on the choice of both the points. If I chose a different point for x0 and x1, I get a different secant line whose slope could be much different. So unlike for a linear function, this slope depends on the choice of the points.
We can also write this formula in terms of x naught and delta x rather than in terms of x1. And this formula is exactly like the other formula we had for the linear function. The change in the input is f of x naught plus delta x, that's the top point, minus f of x naught divided by the change in the input, which is simply delta x. Now these secant lines are nice linear approximations of the function f, but for many applications we want to know what the slope of the function looks like as we zoom in. If we zoom closely in here, we can see that the secant line in red is not the best approximation of the function f, which is graphed by the blue curve. How can we get the best approximation right near x naught? Well, we can't just set delta x to zero. If we did that, we would get that delta f over delta x is zero over zero. And this is undefined. So that's not the way we can get the best linear approximation for the function f around the point x naught. But it's the right idea. We can make delta x smaller and smaller. The smaller we make delta x, the better the approximation right near x naught. As long as we don't make delta x all the way zero so that we run into the problem with this undefined slope, we'll get better and better approximations the smaller we make delta x. We can use this slope of a secant line applet to explore how a secant line depends on the value of x naught as well as the interval delta x. This dark blue point is at the coordinates x naught, f of x naught. If we add delta x to the x coordinate, we get to the cyan point whose coordinates are x naught plus delta x, f of x naught plus delta x. Right now, x naught is set at 0.3 and delta x is 1. In this case, delta f, or this applet calls it delta y because it's the y coordinate, happens to be 1.6, as you can see from this calculation right here. So the change in the input is 1, and the change in the output is 1.6. The slope is therefore 1.6. Now let's imagine we wanted to have a linear approximation to f, the curve in green, that is a really good approximation to f right in the neighborhood of this blue point. To improve this approximation, we can shrink the value of delta x. We could make it 0.1 rather than 1, or even make it 0.01. In fact, we can zoom in. And we can see indeed that the red line is close to the green curve. In this case, the slope of the secant line is 0.61. We can make delta x even smaller we make it 0 0.001, now we see that the slope is 0 0.601. If we make it even smaller, well now it's 0 0.600, and there's probably another one here, but it's rounded off. So it looks like this slope is getting very close to the value 0.6 as we make delta x smaller and smaller. But of course we can't exactly make delta x zero, if we do that, we get 0 over 0. As we said before, that's undefined. Instead, what we can do is put in a really, really small number in for delta x to see that we're very close to 0.6. For the function we saw in the applet, the slope of the secant, given by this formula, seemed to approach a given number as we made this distance delta x get smaller and smaller. In fact, it looked like the secant lines were approaching a particular line as delta x got closer and closer to zero. This particular line is called the tangent line, and the value that the slope, delta f over delta x, is approaching as delta x gets closer and closer to zero is called the limit of delta f over delta x as delta x approaches zero. We write this as limit delta x going to zero of delta f over delta x, which by this formula is the limit as delta x goes to zero of f of x naught plus delta x minus f of x naught over delta x.
Here we're not defining a limit precisely, but it's just the value that this quantity gets closer and closer to as delta x gets closer and closer to zero. Of course, we can't let delta x get exactly to zero because then we would have zero over zero, but we can let it get really, really close. You can think of the idea of asking a two-year-old not to touch a lamp. What will the two-year-old do? It will look at you and try to get as close as he can to touching that lamp without actually touching it. He'll see how close he can get without getting into trouble. That's the idea here. We get into trouble if we let delta x be exactly zero, but we'll get as close as we possibly can. Remember that the slope of the secant line was the average rate of change of f. On the other hand, the slope of the tangent line we can refer to as the instantaneous rate of change. And we'll denote it not by delta f over delta x, but instead by df over dx. And by this, we just mean the limit, which we rewrite over here. So again, the line with the slope is called the tangent line, and the slope itself is called the derivative of f at the point where x is equal to x naught. To emphasize that the slope is calculated at a particular point, we often write it as df dx evaluated at x equals x naught. Or sometimes we write it with a different notation, call it f prime at x naught. Either of these ways denote the derivative. The derivative is the slope of the tangent line, and we often say it is the slope of the function itself at x equals x naught. In the secant line applet, remember, if we put in delta x equals zero, the slope was undefined. However, if we check this check mark show limit when delta x is equal to zero, when we plug in delta x equals zero, the applet shows the limit, the derivative, as delta x goes to zero. And indeed, we see in the case when x naught equals 0 0.3 that the derivative is 0 0.6. Of course, this derivative depends on the value of x naught. If we change x naught, the slope changes. In other words, the derivative takes on different values depending on the value of the point at which you evaluate the derivative.